Um, brethren, we're going to do things a little bit different. Uh, we're going to have each of our admins, so that's Satyrus, myself, Murat, Mahir, and Robert, um, introduce the speakers um, uh, on a weekly basis. So today we're going to be giving the mic to Worshipful Brother Gurdip Verdi to um, do the introduction to today's speaker. But before I intro before uh, Gurdip comes on, I'm just going to invite Raymond Bodell, the founding secretary for the Freemasons Without Borders Mark Master Masons Lodge, to give a, a, a small update for us. Hi, Ray. Hi, Amit. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, I know many of you may have heard this already before, but maybe it's worth just taking a minute of everybody's time to repeat the idea of founding this lodge, Freemasons Without Borders Mark Lodge, uh, is really moving on very, very swiftly. The lodge is going to meet three times a year with an installation meeting in Mark Mason's Hall, London, and the other two meetings being held in different provinces and districts under the aegis of the Grand Lodge of Mark Master Mason somewhere around the world. Um, we've already announced, announced mm. our Primus, uh, Primus Master, who is right, the Grand Recorder, Right Worshipful Brother Brian Williams, and the two Primus Wardens are to be Right Worshipful Brother Thomas Quinn, the Provincial Grand Master for London, and Very Worshipful Brother Christian Mahutu, for, who is the Grand Inspector of Romania. Guess what? I have 207 petitioners forms at present. So, very busy times. But I will say, please, brethren, those of you that have said, yes, I'm in, if you're still owing clearance certificates, I know they take in a bit of time to get because obviously of lockdowns and getting hold of secretaries to do their duties. But if you can remind you, don't forget those clearance certificates are needed as soon as possible. If you're interested further, I heard the chat a few minutes ago about things. If you need further details, I circulated my email. Um, on the chat and of course is available directly from anybody within Freemasons Without Borders. So I look forward to another deluge of emails, petitioners forms. Are we gonna make 250? That's the next question. That's our next landmark, I think. So thanks everybody for responding. So is it, is it worth saying that in this order that you only need clearance certs from units you're not a member of? No. You only need you only need clearance certificates from units that you have resigned from. If you have never resigned, you're nice and easy. It's only clearance certificates that you have resigned from. And if you are coming from a district abroad, you need evidence that you have taken within a chapter, within the York Rite, or otherwise, that you have actually taken the mark degree, which is often contained within your own chapter certificates, etc. Lovely. Thanks for asking the question, Martin. Thank you, Ray, for that update. Uh, Pleasure. I'm excited uh, the way it's going at the moment. Um, brethren, without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Worshipful Brother Gadeep Verdi. Hi, Gadeep. Thank you, Amit. Brethren, good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening to you all. It's wonderful to see so many of you joining us here today. As always, I shall start with the important housekeeping notices. The meeting is being recorded and will be posted onto our YouTube channel. Therefore, those of you who do not wish to be seen, please feel free to turn your video off. To avoid any disruptions during the talk, could you please ensure that your microphones are kept on mute throughout? There will be a Q&A session after the talk. If you'd like to ask today's speaker a question, please use the hand up icon, which can be found in the participants or reactions tab on Zoom. Once you have done this, please wait for your name to be called out. You may then unmute yourself, ask your question, but please do not forget to mute yourself again. To save your spot in the queue, you can do this at any time during the talk. I would also like to remind brethren to please keep to questions regarding the topic of the talk and to avoid making any statements. This includes the chat area. As always, we're giving away two of our bespoke Freemasons Without Borders mugs. For a chance to win, please answer the following question. In which year was our current Grand Master, His Royal Highness, Duke of Kent, installed? Please type your answer in the chat section and the first two correct answers will win. Brethren, it is now my pleasure to introduce to you Worshipful Brother Robert Cooper. 
Robert, also known as Bob to all, is a proud Scottish Freemason. He was initiated into the Lodge of Light in September 1985 and was raised three months later. His love for Scottish Freemasonry was such that he became a founder member of Edinburgh Castle Lodge and became Wishful Master in 1998. He was also a Master of Lodge Sir Robert Moray in 2007, the premier Scottish Lodge of Research for two years. In addition, in 2012, he served as the Master of Lodge Quarter Coronati in London, which is the oldest research lodge in the world. Bob is also a member of many Masonic orders, some of which include the Great Priory of Scotland, the Supreme Grand Royal Art Chapter of Scotland, the Royal Order of Scotland, the Supreme Council for Scotland. He is also a member of several non-Masonic esoteric societies, such as the Free Fishermen, the Free Gardeners, the Hammermen, and a couple of others that cannot be named. Bob has been honored by many Grand Lodges and Masonic orders, including the Grand Lodge of Brazil, the Grand Lodge of California, and District Grand Lodge of Central South Africa. Bob took up the position of curator of the Grand Lodge of Scotland Museum and Library in June 1994. His position of high responsibility meant that he was the custodian of many unique and rare documents relating to Freemasonry, including the oldest lodge records in the world dating to 1599, the St. Clair Charters dating to 1601, and the Shaw Statutes dating to 1598. He is the author of numerous lectures on all aspects of Freemasonry and has written and edited 14 books, including The Complete Manual of Freemasonry, Cracking the Freemasons Code, The History and Origins of the Order of Free Gardeners. He has also written numerous papers, such as The Revenge of the Operative, for the book Marking Well, published to mark the 150th anniversary celebrations of the Mark Grand Lodge of England and Wales. In 2005, Bob completed a three month round the world lecture tour, visiting South Africa, India, Australia, New Zealand, and the USA, where he frequented as a guest on radio. Bob has appeared in several television programs, including the documentary on The Real Da Vinci Code, and more recently, the Secrets of Masons by BBC Scotland, which was the most viewed documentary it had ever produced. Worshipful brother Robert Cooper, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for that very fulsome introduction. Um, I think you've cut, cut about five minutes of my time available. Um, but yes, thank you very much. Um, and as uh, you've already said, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone, wherever you might be. Um, it's always a pleasure to be invited to come along and talk um, about uh, things that are happening or happened um, in Scotland. And as, as has already been said, I mean, I've been the curator of the Grand Lodge of Scotland Museum and Library for 26 years coming up for 27 this year. Um, and in that time, inevitably, I've kind of picked up a few things along the way. So what I'm going to try and do tonight is talk about um, the order uh, of free gardeners um, from uh, its origins, uh, more particularly its origins, because I think it's uh, very fascinating. Um, and what I've done is I've put together a PowerPoint presentation so that you don't have to look at my ugly mug all night. Um, you get to look at uh, some pictures instead of me. And uh, with the power of technology, um, we should be able to put that on the screen um, in a minute. Um, and fingers crossed, it seems to be working. We tried it earlier on. Um, very quickly, I think uh, one introductory comment that I would like to make is that a lot of people don't perhaps uh, fully appreciate that Scotland is in many, many ways very different from not only Masonically, but in terms of esoteric societies and fraternities, is very different from uh, virtually any other country in the world. Um, this may well be due to the geography. Um, after all, it's the most northwesterly part of an island off the northwest coast of Europe. Um, and so things um, were left uh, in isolation for a very long time. And I think that um, uh, impacted on the way 
um, people got together, particularly in terms of um, their occupation. And we maybe have a chance to talk a little bit about that afterwards. Um, so, yes, let's try and share this screen. Um, share. And I'll try and hide all these boxes. That's perfect, Bob. Okay, good. Oh, sorry. I managed to put them back. Um, right. So, um, one of the immediate things um, I have to say is that free, the free gardeners um, are almost as old as the Freemasons themselves, um, certainly in, in Scotland. And I'll be drawing some comparisons um, with uh, the free gardeners and the Freemasons to give you some kind of insight into what I've just been saying about the differences um, from Scotland compared to anywhere else. And uh, this is a bit of a journey. I'm going to show you a few things, if I can get it to work. Um, we are blessed because the free gardeners' records remain in existence. And the whole story really begins um, in the county of East Lothian. And this is a map. It's the, it's the only one I could get at the kind of last minute. So the little flags, by the way, are nothing to do with free gardeners. These are some of the um, golf courses um, that are scattered around the county. Um, and as you can see right in the middle of the image there, you have the county town of Haddington. Um, and it's significant, I think, that when um, the aristocracy uh, got sufficient money and sufficient wealth, they moved out of the city of Edinburgh, which is on the far left of the map, um, and they would move into the rich agricultural land um, of uh, East Lothian. And it was there that they would uh, build country mansions and to accompany those mansions um, were very large gardens called policies in Scotland. Now, obviously stonemasons built the, built the uh, mansion houses and the free gardeners laid out the policies that surrounded them. And here's just one, um, one example of a typical uh, country mansion um, in East Lothian, East Lothian uh, Long Nidri House. As you can see, it is rather grand. Um, and surrounding it, uh, although you can't see it too well from the photograph, there are uh, large laid out gardens. So what I'm getting at here is that you not only had the craft of stone masonry, but uh, next, going cheek by jowl um, with the stonemasons were the gardeners. And so this is where it all began, and certainly in terms of the earliest written records. And you can see here the photograph of um, the pub um, in Haddington, where the free gardeners actually met. They owned the pub on the ground floor, which they rented out, and the lodge meetings were held on the first floor immediately above. Interestingly, the access to the Free Gardener's Lodge Room on the first floor was from a side entrance uh, up a set of stairs where halfway up, halfway between, was um, a very small room that almost certainly was where the candidate was at left, um, very much similar to um, a chamber of reflection in some other um, Masonic uh, lodges uh, across Europe. Um, the symbolism um, is uh, very clearly similar uh, to that of the Freemasons, um, but the, the one big difference that you can always tell uh, Freemasons from Free Gardeners is the uh, inclusion of uh, a hooked pruning knife. And if the hooked pruning knife appears, then you can almost be uh, certain that this is a reference to the free gardeners, not the Freemasons. Now, the reason why they use the square and the compasses is because not just like the stonemasons, they, uh, they also designed, they would use square and compasses to draw designs for gardens, be it circular designs and square designs, etc., etc. So they use the same working tools as stonemasons, uh, the one big difference, as I say, being the pruning knife. 
So the first writings of the first rules and regulations of the free gardeners are what are called interjunctions in Scottish, um, uh, which relates to the free gardeners of Haddington. So although they're dated 1676, they talk about activities uh, well before that period. And so we know that there was a lot of activity going on at the same time the stonemasons' lodges of Scotland were developing into freemasons' lodges. And this is perhaps one of the most important points to make here, um, that the oldest lodge records uh, in the world are not of Masonic lodges, but of stonemasons' lodges. Now, these stonemasons' lodges later start to admit non-stonemasons, and that's how it comes to be a Masonic lodge, because over time, um, all the uh, stonemasons simply disappear. And what happens is you end up with people like me who have joined a stonemasons lodge and the stonemasons have simply disappeared. And there's a whole reason for that. Um, not only do the earliest records talk about regulations, but they also describe um, the three degrees of a free gardener, apprentice gardener, journeyman gardener, and master gardener. And I'm sure you will see the close similarity that there is uh, to Freemasonry. Um, so that's the earliest uh, minutes. Now, unlike um, um, Freemasonry, the ritual is based on a different part of uh, the Old Testament, different part of scripture. It's based on the Garden of Eden. Quite naturally, of course, now, um, in my opinion, the the reference to scripture by these early Scottish fraternities was quite deliberate. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Here, I really just want to focus um, on the free gardeners. And um, so the ritual begins with the Garden of Eden being the first and original garden, as far as the free gardeners of, of Scotland would, knew, would know at the time, this was the first and perfect garden. Sorry, put that in twice. They even go to the extent, just a little bit later in their records, of making it very clear what the, uh, the term operative gardening and speculative gardeners, because just like the stonemasons lodges, they very early on started to admit gentlemen um, or, or aristocrats or professional people into their lodges um, who were not um, gardeners, who didn't work in the trade of gardening. So there was a clear division between the membership of these lodges. Um, gardening for the operative was the first paragraph, as you can see. And I think it's rather nicely put as to what a, a speculative gardener was. And that, as you can see, is um, in, in the second paragraph there. Now, here this raises a very interesting point, not just for free gardeners, but also for Freemasons. You have stonemasons um, uh, and gardeners who are working at that trade during the day, stonemasons building buildings and gardeners laying out and cultivating gardens. But they didn't do that when they were in their lodge. Stonemasons didn't build anything physical in their lodge at night after work. Likewise, the free gardeners did not do any gardening work in their lodges at night. So although these people were, were operative in terms of their working day, they were very clearly speculative when they are attending their lodges. So anyway, uh, to the degrees, a, a little bit, there's obviously quite a lot of esoteric information that I can't uh, give you here. Um, but uh, the first degree focuses very, very firmly on Adam. And that, of course, is um, the first gardener in the world. And his duties in this perfect garden are therefore very, very minimal. Um, he is, in fact, the first free gardener because he doesn't actually do any gardening at all. It's a perfect gardener. Um, the problem, of course, uh, very quickly uh, arises in Genesis when Eve is 
uh, created by God and uh, the original sin is committed and they are cast out of the garden. So Adam, although he is the first free gardener, is also probably the first disgraced free gardener. Um, the second degree picks up the story about what happens with Adam having been expelled from the garden. Um, he is now committed to wandering the world, trying to restore um, the Garden of Eden. Um, the, the, the world has now become a garden that's filled with weeds and un, other unwanted plants. And so he has, his, as a journeyman gardener, his job is to wander the world, um, trying to remove all these manifestations of his original sin that's manifest in, manifested in things like weeds and briars, etc. Um, there is even a, uh, some links um, with uh, Noah um, and with the New Testament, which is unlike Freemasonry. Um, there is a link to the New Testament where there is a mention of the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, the Master Gardener's degree, of course, is the culmination um, of the craft of the gardeners. Um, and if I remember, I'll mention um, the additional degrees the free gardeners have or had. Um, but the third degree, of course, is the culmination of the series of the craft gardening um, degrees. And uh, not surprisingly, um, when you read um, uh, Kings and Chronicles, um, you will find that um, King Solomon's temple looms very large um, in the ritual, the third degree ritual of the free gardeners. And that's because, and I think they are um, really trying to put one over on the stonemasons here, because it, as it expressly says in Kings and Chronicles, although there was, uh, the, the building was made of stone, um, when the building was complete, the gardeners finished it. Um, and in fact, um, uh, as you can see, Kings 1, chapter 6, verse 18 is very specific. Um, there was no stone to be seen in the, in the completed King Solomon's temple because it had been completely covered by cedar, which was, of course, installed by gardeners, not stone masons. So let's have a wee look at some interesting old photographs of the Order of Free Gardeners. Here you have three, obviously, um, I don't know how, how to politely, I mean, they're clearly uh, older than, um, than average. Um, and the magnificent aprons they've got um, go from uh, uh, waist to ankle. And I, when I first saw these, uh, I thought they were in fact banners, but no, as you can see from the photograph, they are in fact aprons and very ornate they are too. Over time, just like um, the Masons lodges, the apron, which originally for the for the Masons was as large as the gardener's apron, slowly shrinks, gets smaller. Um, and this is, uh, you can see, still a very early image of a free gardener, but the apron has shrunk considerably from the previous image and he's now wearing a sash and jewels which makes it very much more similar to um, Freemasonry. So you can see, uh, this is an example of um, the apron, which I thought, uh, as I said, said when I first saw them, I thought, my goodness, that's far too big to be anything other than a banner, small banner, but it's not, it's actually an apron. And the, just like Freemasonry, the, the plethora of symbolism that's contained on these aprons, uh, even though it does a lot of our Masonic aprons. Um, and you can see the, the I mean, there, that's Lodge um, 21 in Baylison, uh, uh, Lodge Adelphi, founded in 1900. So these are considerably later. Uh, Lodge Cambus Lang Philanthropic, uh, founded in 1823. Um, and you'll notice they use the word AF ancient free and accepted free gardeners. So AFFG is the ancient free, free gar, ancient fraternity of free gardeners. The aprons, and this one in particular is a magnificent example 
um, which um, you can see front and centre um, is very prominent King Solomon uh, with the plans of the temple um, in his right hand. And you can see all the working tools, not just the pruning knife, but all the working tools um, of the free gardeners, some of which also overlap with the working tools of Freemasons. Um, here is a more, much more modern mass produced apron, um, still very ornate, must have been fairly expensive to produce. The letters are made from brass and are sewn onto the apron. Um, very luxurious, um, even um, by some standards of today. Uh, here is an ordinary apprentice gardener's apron, um, um, much less in the way of symbolism, but still quite a, a luxurious apron for a, a, an apprentice um, to be uh, wearing. The sashes equally are, are quite ornate with bullion thread, um, brass letters, and of course the square compasses um, and pruning knife. This would suspend, uh, this would be a collar that would have a suspended collar jewel. Even the sashes they wore um, are uh, reminiscent of the, the banners or aprons, I should say, um, that we saw originally. Very uh, ornate um, references to um, uh, guard the Garden of Eden. And in my opinion, I think these could have doubled up as tracing boards. And even jewels, and this is um, coming along a bit later, um, more modern times, um, certainly just after the First World War, um, you can see they are, uh, they've got quite a good, quite a large similarity to that of Freemasonry. But when we come to their diplomas, I think they really do beat us hands down. So here is um, a, a, a master mason, a master gardener's diploma. Um, and as you can see, it too could almost be um, a tracing board in its own right. We have King Solomon um, down on the bottom right, the Garden of Eden, of course, in the, in the centre. And just like us, they have their motto, in the East reigneth love, wisdom, harmony and truth. But notice the, the sun, the moon and seven stars, and then the all-seeing eye at top centre. So again, lots of similarities with Freemasonry, but it would never be accepted as a Masonic order because the ritual is uh, based on something quite different and the interpretation um, of scripture is quite different from that of Freemasonry. Um, so we know from all this information that the origin of uh, Free Gardeners and its subsequent development had a very similar trajectory from that um, of Freemasonry. Um, we know, for instance, that um, uh, stonemasons of, of Edinburgh camped in Haddington uh, on their way to Newcastle in the 1640s. And we begin to think, um, although absolute proof is lacking, we're beginning to think that the free gardeners, or the gardeners certainly, were observing what the masons were doing in their lodges and of course the lodges in those days moved around to wherever the work was and so i suspect we strongly suspect that the gardeners got the idea of hope of creating a fraternity um, based very much on what they saw the stonemasons of scotland doing um, and the mere fact that they uh, uh, got an overlap of symbols and also in, in more, perhaps more importantly, terminology. Um, they call their, uh, their gatherings, um, a meeting in lodges, etc., etc. So gardeners are admitted to the lodge um, and that's, only refer that's the only degree referred to um, uh, in the early records. Um, Sometime later, they refer to the second degree ceremony and later still a third degree. And this too is very similar to the origins of the Masonic degrees, where the ritual um, that we have here in Scotland, which dates from 1696, only mentions two degrees, but later the third degree is added. Um, and all the procedures are all extremely similar. Um, Non-gardeners, have to pay extra 
for the privilege of joining uh, a gardener's lodge. Um, they had to pay double the fee. Same goes for the stonemasons' lodges in Edinburgh, in particular, where the aristocrats who join as early as 1634 had to pay three times, in, in that instance, three times the actual fee that a, a, a working stonemason uh, would have had to have paid. So again, I suspect that we see similarities here that are being copied, just copied in terms of procedure, but certainly not in terms of ritual and in terms of uh, things like diplomas, etc. So the free gardeners uh, created entirely speculative grand lodges, um, just like the Freemasons lodges here in Scotland did. They also created a grand lodge, but and this is where things diverge uh, radically from uh, the way um, Freemasonry developed. Um, the need for some kind of um, social welfare provision was very strong um, in, uh, in this eight, 17th and especially into the 18th century. There was no welfare state, there was no um, uh, state aid, um, uh, no pension etc. All that there was was the pretty decrepit and pretty appalling poor house system of relief. Um, and so it's not surprising that these fraternities uh, decided to look after their members financially. And the free gardeners, like most of the other um, fraternities, uh, did exactly the same um, in terms of initially providing um, insurance for burial costs, uh, funeral costs. Uh, um, later, they developed that into unemployment insurance, sickness insurance, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, and death benefits. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that these people, these gardeners, were um, volunteers. The gardeners' lodges were not businesses. They were set up as voluntary esoteric initiatory um, bodies. They had no, no, not necessarily any great business acumen, but they were trying obviously to look after their members. And as they started to uh, develop the kind of insurance, um, uh, you know, friendly society type insurance, um, they, that took more and more of their time. And you can see from their records and indeed from their ritual books, that what, what was happening, and it's very obvious, certainly from around about 1850, 1840, what's happening is that more and more of their time is taken up with running um, the insurance or the benefits side of the lodge. And as the, more and more time was spent taking money in and paying money out, um, it became more and more bureaucratic. They wouldn't pay out money, for example, without a certificate from a doctor confirming that you were ill or uh, a death certificate in case of funeral expenses. So all this required a great deal of bureaucratic work and the ritual suffered accordingly. The ritual, um, large parts of ritual, um, when compared to the original, um, have disappeared. Um, by the time we get to the 1900s, uh, the ritual is, is very bare bones, which is really a shame because the ritual itself is very rich and detailed, the original ritual that is, very rich and detailed, um, with some uh, Kabbalistic overtones for sure. But as I say, the, the demands of running an insurance business meant that the ritual slowly but surely um, had elements stripped out of it um, to the point where eventually all that was happening was uh, people were being initiated, passed and raised in our terms very quickly, all on the one night, so that they could immediately access the insurance benefits offered by the lodge. Then, of course, we know that after the Second World War, um, the welfare state was introduced um, not only was the National, National Health Service established, national insurance payments uh, had to be made. And so even if, you, even if there was a will to pay money into a free gardener's lodge, 
they simply couldn't afford it. They had to pay the state for um, the welfare, you know, the national insurance, um, uh, all the benefits. And so there was no need or no point in duplicating those insurance benefits that were now supplied by the government. And so almost at a stroke um, on the introduction of the welfare state, the need of um, the free gardeners lodges at that time simply disappeared almost overnight. And most of these lodges collapsed in the 1950s and 60s. There were one or two still functioning in the 1970s. But as I say, the main reason for their existence, providing insurance benefits, had simply disappeared. And sadly for them, they could not revert to being an entirely esoteric and initiatory organization. That knowledge had been lost. And so eventually these lodges slowly disappeared um, from, the, uh, from the fabric of society, which was, as I say, rather sad. Now, this is another uh, point of divergence um, with Freemasonry because round about the same time, um, most Masonic lodges in Scotland uh, either singly or as a group, would provide insurance benefits to its members. And the Grand Lodge of Scotland um, uh, were looking at this and realised that these people were actually, the, the, the Masons, these were now entirely Freemasons. The Freemasons of Scotland were essentially running a business. And uh, they quickly appreciated that that was not what Freemasonry was all about. And in the 19, sorry, in the 1850s, and a little bit later, the Grand Lodge of Scotland instructed all their lodges uh, to abandon um, these benefit society um, insurance type uh, trappings. If they wanted to, they could continue that, but it was nothing to do with the Masonic Lodge. It had to be a standalone insurance business. And in some ways, um, that saved Freemasonry. Because if we had continued down the same route as the free gardeners, we probably would have ended up pretty much the same as as them as they were they eventually uh, were as being uh, largely irrelevant after the institution um, of the welfare state. So anyway, I do hope that you find that to be of uh, some interest, and that uh, I'm happy to take questions and try and answer. Um, uh, as much as I can, and I'm happy to stay on for as long as you wish. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for watching and listening, everyone. Thank you, Bob, so much for that informative and exciting talk. Uh, we will go straight to the questions. We have uh, Othman. Othman, you're on mute. Othman? That's it. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. I, I noticed that one side of the compass was showing. Is there any significance to that? And, uh, and is there any other gardeners, free gardeners, lodges around the, the world other than Scotland? Uh, well, to answer your last question first, um, yes, there are free gardeners lodges. They underwent a revival. Um, I, I wrote a book about them in 2001, and um, people um, took a fancy to that. Um, some lodges were established in Scotland. I believe there's quite a few now in England, um, and there are um, a few uh, dotted around in other places, like um, uh, the United States, there's a few. Some of the original uh, lodges still exist in uh, places like South Africa. And we know this because when the Grand Lodge, the, the Grand Lodge of Scotland collapsed um, in the 1960s, in the late 1960s, all the Grand Lodge, uh, the Free Gardeners Grand Lodge material was sent out to South Africa because they, the, the lodges there continued to function. Um, where that material is now, I do not know. Um, as to the symbolism of, of, of the, the compasses, uh, this is also something that's very common um, in the Masonic lodges uh, here in Scotland. 
from as early as that, where one point is exposed and the other is disclosed. And there is no, as far as I can tell, there is no obvious reason why that should be. Um, it may well be that they just like to see them interlocked. And I suspect it's simply an artistic thing. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Osman. We can go to uh, Ray Walton. Good evening, Robert. Excellent presentation, truly excellent. Uh, were there at any point in its history developed side degrees? Yes, um, they had the equivalent of the Royal Arch um, uh, and it's referenced um, along those lines. Whether it was a direct lift of the Masonic Royal Arch, I can't tell you because we can't find the ritual. Um, but they do make mention of the royal art um, in some of the records. So it looks like they developed a royal arch equivalent. They also had the equivalent of the Knights Templar, um, where there are reference to the Knights of Ephesus, um, which I take to be the equivalent of, the, of the, the Knight Templar. But again, the ritual for the Knights of Ephesus are missing. Um, and of course, Ephesus was is known as the place of exile, so that's that's a very intriguing. Um, both of those side orders are very intriguing in terms of the possible ritual uh, implications of it, but unfortunately, we don't know very much more. The records of the free gardeners are scattered to the four winds. Unfortunately, they were placed in local archives and not centralised, and that simply meant that. Um, there is no one place that you can go for information. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. We can go to uh, Ted. Uh, Ted, you're on mute. Ted, you're on mute. Unmute, there we go. There it's done. Originally, you had me unmuted, muted, and I couldn't unmute myself. <clears throat> Thank you for the uh, excellent, ex excellent presentation. Uh, I was curious, well, the, one of the questions was asked whether there are existing lodges of uh, 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 gardens today. Uh, you mentioned something about the USA. Did, uh, is there a Grand Lodge? No, there is, there is no Grand Lodge. Um, the free gardeners have grown organically um, at lodge level. Um, and I suspect that that is probably um, a good thing. Um, and I say that because uh, once you have a kind of centralized authority, things start to become standardized and all sorts of interesting differences start to disappear. Um, and that was certainly one of the problems that the free gardeners had when a Grand Lodge was founded. In fact, it's even worse than that because there was more than one Grand Lodge. Um, the first Grand Lodge that was founded wanted to standardize the ritual and lots of people, um, uh, lots of free gardeners didn't, didn't like what the standardized ritual was uh, uh, to be. And so they formed their own Grand Lodge to preserve their ritual and just to confuse things. So you had a Grand Lodge of the West of Scotland based in Glasgow and you had a Grand Lodge of the East of Scotland based in Edinburgh, but they had lodges in both parts of the country. So it was all very confusing. Um, and, and, and that happened also in England. Um, Free Garden moved into England and they founded Grand Lodges in England but also there was um, all sorts of schisms over the years. So looking at the history of the free gardeners and grand lodges, I think they would probably, certainly at this stage, not want a grand lodge. I see, I see. I, I interested also about the social services that was grew to maximum in the 1900s. When did the social services really begin? Early um, on? Yeah, they, they started in the, uh, in, in the Victorian era, um, about the time, um, round about the 18, oops, sorry, I've just managed to, managed to disappear myself off the screen for some reason. Sorry, that's better. 
Um, yeah, it was in the uh, 1840s, 1850s. And that, what happened was the government became interested in the fact that working people were just like the cooperative society in many ways, working people were beginning to organize. And there was a lot of um, concern in government circles that uh, that work, working men in particular were organ, organizing themselves and were quite often allied to trade unions, what or what became trade unions. So there was a lot of concern about what they were doing. So the government actually started to introduce legislation to regulate these um, these benefit societies or friendly societies, as they were called. And as those regulations became more and more complex and more and more benefits were introduced, as I said, death benefits, funeral benefits, unemployment insurance, sickness insurance. So the legislation became more and more complicated. Then more and more time was spent by the free gardeners trying to run this, this business. They probably never anticipated that at the very beginning, but that's that's exactly how they ended up, and that was unfortunate for them. Most excellent, thank you. Thank you, Ted. Uh, let's go to Eduardo. Uh, you're on mute, Eduardo. Yes. Okay, now you have allowed me. Uh, okay, hello, Bob. Couple of questions again about the gardeners. Numbers wise, were there more members in the free gardeners than in the stone masons, assuming that there would be more gardens than stone buildings? Uh, it's very hard to make uh, comparisons to the original free gardeners lodges, because as I say, the, the records are, are scattered to the four winds. But by the time um, we get to the 1720s, um, it's very obvious that there is a bit, there's a lot of competition between the, by this time, Freemasons and Free Gardeners. Um, and indeed, what we found was uh, in the records, the operative gardeners in Haddington um, ended up in direct competition with speculative gardeners' lodges based particularly in Dunfermline. Um, and then as, as the organization grew, when we get to the early uh, 19th century, there were more free gardeners lodges and more free gardeners than Freemasons. Um, that's just the way it was. So it was a much bigger organization um, than, than Freemasonry was. Uh, was it as attractive to the non-trade uh, members, i.e. the speculative or the gentleman thing. Yes, very much so. In fact, this the, the lodge, the lodge in Dunfermline, um, which was founded, I think, in 1710, uh, was entirely speculative. There were no gardeners in it at all. They were all a professional people. They were all aristocrats. And what's very interesting is because the records of that lodge still exist, what we see is that um, later, remember, there is no Grand Lodge of Free Gardeners at this time. The Grand Lodge of Scotland was founded in 1736, and um, almost every single member of the lodge in Dunfermline, including the aristocrats, um, including the Earls of Elgin and Kincardin, etc., all moved over to Freemasonry and completely abandoned free gardeners altogether. Now that's almost certainly because when, when you didn't have a grand lodge, the, the, the most senior position that you could get was as master of a free gardeners lodge. All of a sudden, here's a grand lodge that is a national, uh, it's, a, it's a national body and you can not only be a master of a lodge, but you can you can aim to become the grand master of the grand lodge. And that, in fact, many of the members of that speculative lodge, when they jumped ship and joined Freemasonry, a lot of them then went on to become senior Freemasons 
in the uh, in the new Grand Lodge of Scotland, um, the, the Freemasons Grand Lodge of Scotland. Ah, okay. And one final query. I know you mentioned the other free fraternities. So uh, could you mention the you are a member of the free fishermen? We spoke before about the free horsemen. Something. Did you or do you know of a paper that actually discusses these other free uh, fraternities or something that uh, just to understand, did it become like some sort of a fad? Every group, let's do a free fraternity like the others or were there genuinely insurance uh, approach? Yeah. Related to community kind of thing. The insurance side of things doesn't appear until almost 200 years oh. after all these organizations had been established. Um, I mean, they would, they would obviously have a, 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 a kitty or a small sum of money within the lodge, but it was when they start to bring people in that are not stonemasons and not gardeners. And of course, remember, they're charging more for these people to join. Then all of a sudden, they've got more money to pay for the pay their members. Now, um, as, as a working gardener, you're much more likely to uh, be injured or be sick because you're a working man, whereas an aristocrat tends to eat better, you know, live better, so and he would not need to claim money from the lodge, whereas the operative gardener certainly would. So that's, that's what happened over time. So the you know and and, and that's, that's exactly what, what happened, uh, sadly. But you you raise an interesting point, and this is a very important point I think, which highlights the difference between Scotland and England. Um, in England, there are all sorts of other fraternities like the Odd Fellows, uh, the Druids, um, uh, the Shepherds, but these are inventions. Um, the Odd Fellows, for example were invented by men of leisure in a pub in Drury Lane in London. Oh. Um, so these are pure figments of um, the imagination, which um, and I suspect that some of these guys didn't want to join Freemasonry because it was already established and they couldn't be grand masters. So they decided, I'm going to create my own organization. Um, but the difference, the crucial difference between England and Scotland for me is the fact that these organizations in England, although apparently similar, are pure invention, whereas these other free carters, free colliers, free gardeners are all actually based on the daily working lives of people who did that job. And I think so it's, it's grounded if you like, in, in a much more realistic um, way of looking at the world. And I think that's perhaps typically Scottish, um, we're looking at the world with a slightly uh, harder eye than, than, than other parts of the world, shall we say. Yeah. Any Thank publication? You for asking. Yeah, that's it. Just Why don't we have a few other people that are very keen to ask some questions. If we have time, we'll come back to you. Okay. Thank you, Eduardo. Can we go to uh, Amit Watts? Hi, <laughs> Gadeep. Thanks a lot. Uh, it seems weird asking a question. Bob, thank you ever so much. Fantastic talk. I won't take too much of your time up. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to say that I know Henry um, Adams has kindly put an email address for contact. Um, if anybody does want to get contact, or know more about it. Um, it was, it was a fascinating talk. Um, I, I'll just read a message from, it was actually a question for a question. Um, Ian Galliork um, has put on the horsemen were mentioned. Are you in the Society of the Horsemen's Word? Or does it still exist? Um, the horsemen are, are slightly different in the sense that um, they didn't actually have um, permanent fixed locations like the colliers or the gardeners. Um, and of course, sadly, the use of horses um, in agriculture has virtually ceased to exist. So in, in short, there, there are some horsemen, and I'll, if I remember rightly, I'll tell you an interesting story, but there are a few individual horsemen around that continue the tradition, but because there's actually 
and a horse, an actual physical live horse is essential for the ritual. And because there's so, so few horses around in, in agriculture, and it is tied very directly to farm, um, to farm workers, um, the numbers are tiny in comparison to how they at one, at one time would be. So again, it's, it's the modern world, you know, it's become mechanized and it's completely overtaken um, that industry. Sad to say, but uh, there are a few around. Yeah. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Bob. We'll go to uh, Andrew Ambrister. Hello, Andrew. Are you on mute? Are you still on mute, Andrew? I'm there. I'm there. Good. Thank you. And well done, Gurdip, in taking over facilitation. Brilliant. And Robert, thanks for that great presentation. Your knowledge is unbelievable on all sorts of orders. I was going to ask about the aristocracy, so uh, I'll ask about a daft lad question, which has always uh, got me, which is if someone sits in a lodge two or three hundred years ago and then takes that ritual and translates it into a different order, which is non-Masonic, were they in some way breaking their obligation? Indeed, was anybody ever disciplined for that? Well, first and foremost, um, the ritual was never written down. Um, and the, and I mean, there's, there's, this is a whole new field. One of my um, abiding interests is in um, the rituals used before the existence of Grand Lodges. Um, and I, Obviously, I'm interested because they're all Scottish, um, and so we have we have a whole series of rituals dating from um, the 1690s um, up to the time and beyond um, at Grand Lodges. So, by looking at these old rituals, we can learn a lot about the development of what these people were actually doing um, in in their lodges, and so. Um, the instruction um, to all the lodges, and this is written and sent to all the lodges in Scotland in 1598 and 1599, um, instructs them um, that they are to memorize uh, something, something very large in terms of size. Um, and it really can only be the ritual, although it's not specified. So that's why the ritual does not appear until a hundred years, more than a hundred years later. Um, and these rituals um, are handwritten and are um, in various archives dotted around Scotland. So in order to study them, you have to come here and look at them. Um, and that's why they're really not well known because unlike um, the first printed rituals, um, Samuel Pritchard in London, of course, being the most famous, the first one um, from 1730, um, that printed ritual, once it's printed, it can be studied, poured over, elaborated, added to, and I'm, I'm convinced that's exactly what happened um, because it was then available to everyone. Whereas a handwritten ritual only used by one person in one entire city um, isn't, isn't common knowledge. Um, and so the ritual itself, although it was understood, was not written down in Scotland, not until after, uh, I, in fact, I don't think it was until after the Grand Lodge of Scotland that the first written ritual appears. Same thing goes for the, the free gardeners. Thank you, Andrew, for asking the question. Can we go to our uh, final question to Lawrence, please? Hi, uh, th th thank you very much, Billy. Thank you very much, uh, Bob, that was very interesting. You nearly got to my question a couple of times, but I was gonna say, what was the relationship like between Freemasonry and the Free Gardeners? Certainly at the beginning, uh, was it considered, if you like, a, a pseudo Masonic body and you weren't allowed to be in both? And if that was so, did it change as they became more of a friendly society and more interested in insurance? 
Yeah, um, really the two never, um, the two never met, if you like. Um, the ritual basis um, of both orders is completely different and the emphasis and the moral teachings and the esoteric elements are, are also very different. So um, there was no, re and, and time would have played a part, but also finance. Um, financing um, membership of two orders by ordinary working people um, was, not, was not possible, although an aristocrat could become a member of both. And indeed, when we get to the 18th century, that's exactly what happens. We find that moneyed people are members of both orders. Um, but interestingly, what happens is um, when these free gardeners lodges start to close in the 1950s, um, when the free gardeners lodge closed, and we've got examples of this, um, they would then simply um, be initiated into the Masonic lodge in where, where they lived. And what is interesting is the, the and I've got examples of this as well, the free gardeners who did that moved from a free gardener's lodge to a Masonic lodge. They sewed their free gardener's lodge onto the back of their Masonic lodge apron. So when they were wearing their apron in a Masonic lodge, you saw that they were wearing a Masonic apron. But the first apron that they were actually wearing was the free gardener's apron because that's where they were first that's where their first obligation was to the free gardeners. So we've got these aprons that are sewn together for that reason. Thank you, that, 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 thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. I see, Ted, you have uh, one burning question you'd like to ask. We'll come to you very quickly. Do you want to ask it? Well, if, if you're pressed for time, no. But, uh, no I'm, I'm not. I, I, I wanted to know if the, if the, the uh, the lodge was reinstated, or one lodge at least, in 2001, you said. And is it under the jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge of Scotland? Yeah. Um, the first lodges were founded uh, fairly soon after that, in, I think, 2003. And they were founded as purely speculative lodges. Um, they had nothing to do with the insurance type business. Um, but because the ritual is so different, they would never be considered to be a Masonic body by the Grand Lodge. So they're not considered to be a Masonic order, just like the free colliers or the, the horsemen. They would never be considered to be Masonic either, although they're esoteric societies. Um, and so uh, at the moment, there is no Grand Lodge looking after these free gardeners lodges. And at the moment, they like it like that. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. Well, brethren, that is all we have time for today. And we'll quickly announce our winners. They are Dudley Tucker and Muhammad Al Dashan. The months are on their way to you. Look out for them in the post. The answer was 1967. I bid you all a very good evening. And good I day. Sorry, yes. I was gonna say, do you wanna mention next week's on? Yes. I look forward to seeing you all and joining us next Tuesday for our lecture, which is on the story of Worshipful Brother Andrew Stevenson and the Black East Degrees by Worshipful Brother Chris Hatton. It is with sad regret uh, that I have to inform you that Worshipful Brother Andrew Stevenson passed away earlier this month on the 4th of February. So this will be a great tribute talk to him. Stay safe, brethren, and see you next Tuesday, same time. Well done, well done. Thank you, Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Really good. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Really good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, brothers. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye.